uh, Rajiv Taylor, um, MD. He's our physician and our director, he'll correct me if I'm wrong, of our sports medicine clinic and, and that in our arduous center. And then um, today we happen to be on our main campus. Um, but he is, uh, I think you're going to love his presentation because it breaks down a lot of different things that I thought, and I'm talking personally myself, I thought when I went to him, I knew what some things would be happening after meeting with a, a physician on feet and knees and elbows for different things that I was struggling with. And it wasn't until I met with him um, that I really understood what my body mechanics were, what was going on and what things I thought I might have needed for surgery and other stuff. When in actuality, um, he helped me see the light on some things and correct some things that I was doing and I didn't have to have surgery. So I'm very thankful and very grateful for his um, profession and for him working with me um, on how I could get my stuff going. And he's done this with a lot of patients and I think you're gonna enjoy it. So with that, I'm turning it over to Dr. Taylor and there we go. Well, thank you, Brett, for that introduction. Um, he's a great guy to have around. <laughs> so I'm gonna start this presentation to uh, after this first slide, let's just test this out. Um, does this work, Brett? Sorry. Yeah, it should. The remote didn't go. It did not. Oh, bizarre. I did this earlier, which I'm not sure why. All right, hold on. Maybe I can. Actually, you know what? I can do it here at the bottom. Sorry. I'll, use, I'll use the mouse. I'm fine with okay. that. How bizarre. All right. So my lecture today is kind of a general lecture on musculoskeletal disorders, and it comprises the orthopedic realm of medicine. But as I will discuss, there's more than just bones um, when it comes to orthopedics. So I will touch base with several things. So a little bit of background about me. I'm an East Coaster. I had, did not have a beard at the time of that picture, so in case you see me, that, that it still is me. Um, born and raised in New Jersey, uh, raised, uh, well actually initially for the first three years of my life and the rest of my life was in Pennsylvania. Did most of my training out that way and decided to come out here for a fellowship in sports medicine and then I saw a big need, in, especially in this area, for non-surgical management of orthopedic conditions and um, I decided to take on this endeavor with the hospital. And so far, it's been pretty good for the last several years. So we're just continuing to grow from the start. And uh, word of mouth has been fantastic, actually. So what is sports medicine? So a physician that is specialized in training, and it comprises treatment of musculoskeletal or orthopedic conditions, prevention of illness and injury related to those things. So we try to maximize functionality, minimize any disabilities, and it could be from sports, work, school, um, any of your uh, lifestyle demands that require physicality. What is the difference between a sports medicine specialist versus an orthopedic surgeon? So pretty much both are well-trained in musculoskeletal disorders um, and treatment of majority of these orthopedic type of conditions. Um, the main obvious difference is one is treated, uh, trained on operative management, uh, which includes a, a whole other part of a residency, and they do spend a lot of time in the operating room, while my side can take a different route, um, generally in medicine, and then subspecializing in a field like sports medicine, which requires a fellowship, and then all the treatments are geared towards all the non-surgical parts of orthopedics. And if you look, majority of orthopedic conditions or mo most reasons why people see an orthopedic surgeon, over 90% of them are non-surgical. So uh, it's a large, large volume of people that don't require surgery that are getting a perspective from a surgical perspective. And when it's not deemed a surgical scenario, um, sometimes people are uh, disenchanted with the process thereafter. So uh, 
the, my field really tries to fill the gap between the primary care world and the orthopedic surgery world. So let's see here. So our goals are to maximize non-operative treatment if need, if need be physical therapy, occupational therapy, and kind of directing how that should be done. Um, in some cases, it's not the right answer. Um, but uh, for instance, you know, I have a lot of patients that are in their 80s and 90s that really their goal is just to be able to go to the kitchen, go to the bathroom, very minimal goals sometimes. And when, depending on how intensive the therapy is, they feel sore. Now, soreness at the age of 20 is different than soreness at 90. Soreness at 90 is considered pain. So um, not a pleasurable experience. So it just depends on the, the person and who would really benefit and who would be motivated to continue with therapy options. The other thing that's very helpful is that when you go from a primary care to an orthopedic surgeon, a lot of the workup will have to be done on the surgery side. For instance, if it's an x-ray or if it's an MRI or if there's another test. So if I do all the workup and figure everything out, and let's say that the worst case is you must have surgery, it's very quick. Um, all the surgeons will um, expedite that. Most of my patients are in within a week um, of any orthopedic surgeon because if it comes from me, it's a definitive surgery, everything has been done, and there's no real question about, um, well, maybe we can manage it non-operatively because that's already been done. And um, all the testing they need has already been completed. So it does expedite the entire process. Do we only see athletes? And, and believe it or not, I work with a lot of different physicians and they always ask me, oh, what kind of athletes do you see? Do you see a lot of sports injuries? Um, the assumption is that we only do sports. The reality is all activities that involve movement, um, not even sports, um, could utilize a field like mine. So all orthopedic conditions. So the whole musculoskeletal system, the orthopedic world is um, around movement. And now if that's sports related or that's just activities of daily living, that all falls into the same umbrella. It's just the, the, the nomenclature gets confusing. So we have a large proportion of active adults here, a lot of golfers, a lot of tennis players, a lot of pickleball players, a lot of weekend warriors. So uh, most of these general orthopedic conditions are, um, uh, are, are definitely covered. And it could also be, I mean, I have several, I have many patients actually that are wheelchair bound, but it doesn't mean they can't have pains, whether it involves their arms or, or even their knees, even despite the fact that they barely walk. Um, these are all things that we do see uh, very commonly. So our community is quite unique. Uh, we have a pretty diverse population, a lot of retired individuals in the desert. Most people would preferably proceed with a non-operative intervention if possible. Um, and a lot of people have, the, I guess, a typical surgical bias of saying, well, my friend had this surgery because they had this. Um, there's a wide spectrum of... Uh, surgical thresholds. Um, some surgeons would operate the first day um, and without trying anything else. And there are other surgeons that would be more conservative about that. So there's a wide spectrum. Um, and I've seen all kinds of cases. And the, the hesitancy is, it's just uncomfortable, right? If somebody speaks to you and you're like, I'm already hesitant. And then they're like, well, this is what we can do. We can surgically repair this. And then it, it kind of, you're kind of taken back. You haven't had time to digest that. So I do have a lot of patients that come for an additional opinion for that reason. And sometimes that is the right uh, answer, but it just needs a little bit more explaining about why and what is wrong. And that's what I really focus on, um, understanding exactly what's wrong and making an educated decision. Because at the end of the day, I'm still a consultant. I, I can't tell you what to do. I can advise you on what I think has worked well for many people and what you could also try. So there are a lot of new technological advances in medicine and in the orthopedic world and also the non-surgical orthopedic world. So PRP, people have heard of, I'm sure you know of people, and stem cell is a big um, a big industry, but yet not, not a proven industry as of yet. So uh, I can always get into more detail uh, later on that. 
Um, so most people out here have multiple musculoskeletal complaints. So it's almost never do I walk into a room and says, it's just my knee. It's like my knee, but oh, can you look at my shoulder? Can you look at my elbow? Can you look at my wrist? Can you look at my hand? So more often than not, I have multiple things I do look at. Um, so that's where, that's the other benefit of a person like me, I don't have to refer to a hand surgeon, a elbow guy, a shoulder guy, a knee guy. I handle everything from head to toe. So what are musculoskeletal disorders? So affecting the human body's movement or musculoskeletal system. So this includes muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves, discs, blood vessels. So as you can see, there's just more than just bones um, and muscles. Um, the parts that are also very, very important are the nerves and blood vessels. There are conditions that manifest that cause pain that are not even related to actually the muscle directly. For instance, if you have a blood clot or if you had a narrowed blood vessel that every time you walked, it couldn't get the blood it needed, then the calf would hurt, for instance. Um, that's a separate issue. And, and many times it's figuring out the right uh, avenue to evaluate. So the key for me is always looking at the entire body and the way it functions. And really your history is very important. I, I really like to sit down and hear what you have to say because that is almost the entire diagnosis is what you say. It, it really all comes from that. And the second part is an exam. So people focus a lot on the tests. Oh, I need an MRI. Well, what is the MRI going to show you? If I MRI most people um, as they get older, we would find something wrong. Is it relevant? So if I MRI someone's back, and I again today I think I saw like four people with a similar scenario where, well, I have a herniated disc in my back. Well, if I MRI every 75 year old that came to my clinic, I could almost guarantee every single one of them would have a disc herniation. Now, is it relevant or not is one thing. So um, it's really taking the useful information from what you say and your clinical picture and then using an image if needed to correlate that and only if we're going to do something with it. So in many cases, I don't require an MRI because what would be the next step? The next step is saying, okay, if I get an MRI, would you do surgery? And your answer is no. So if I have another alternative treatment, would you try that instead? And most people say yes. So the point of the MRI is more of a psychological, um, people just feel better about it, um, but not in all cases do you need to have an advanced image. And an X-ray for the most part, for most of the things I end up seeing is also plenty to uh, determine the cause for most of these conditions that I see. So the scope of practice, um, obviously simple ankle sprains, joint injuries, knees, I mean, just literally every joint in the body. Um, dislocations, obviously we've done relocations. I would assume that you would not come to my clinic with an acute dislocation. So usually a post dislocation and rehabilitation and management, non-surgical fractures, there are fractures that occur, stress fractures and so on and so forth that will heal quite well without needing op surgery. And obviously there are surgery, uh, surgical fractures that must be repaired right away. Um, rotator cuff pathology, very common. Statistically, 50% of the people over age of 66 have rotator cuff tears on both shoulders. So it's, it's very, very common. Tendonitis, we have tendons all over our body. Tendons connect muscle to bone and they can get inflamed. Um, osteoarthritis can manifest wear and tear arthritis, essentially. It's not rheumatoid, it's uh, osteoarthritis. So it's uh, a wear and tear, wearing away of the cartilage surfaces, and I'll get into that as well. Traumatic brain injuries, concussions. Um, my particular clinic doesn't do as much on this. Um, we did have a concussion clinic as well. I think we do a little bit of that still. Um, so primarily the people that are seen for this are usually the football players and athletes that do have uh, traumatic head injuries from playing football off the field. Uh, on the field and uh, they're taken and evaluated and cleared in the clinic thereafter. Nutritional, so there are a lot of supplements that are out there um, understanding what they do and if they're really of any uh, clinical benefit. Injury prevention, certain types of stretching, what you can do. Pre-participation physicals, we do do that in the schools and uh, exercise education and promotion.
and then evaluation and treatment options. So there, there's several things that we do in the office and I really use an ultrasound day in and day out every single day of my practice numerous times a day. An ultrasound is an uh, amazing tool that um, you can actually see structures very clearly. You can see tendons, you can see muscle, and you can see the surface of bone. So clearly you cannot see through bone, but you can see the surface. Now, we're not looking at arthritis with an ultrasound necessarily, and that's why an x-ray is useful, but tissues are very, very clearly visualized in the ultrasound. The problem is it's a narrow spectrum of vision. So if I have an area where I know is that there is an issue, I can look at that and use an ultrasound. Additionally, where it's very useful is I do a lot of procedures under ultrasound guidance. Um, so you can physically watch the needle go to the intended location in every scenario. What the, also the benefit is, is that since you can watch it, and I'll show you exactly where it needs to go, the accuracy is tremendous. Um, they've studied this to nauseum, and they've proven that ultrasound guided or guided procedures are far superior to blind procedures. So most people get a knee injection blind, a shoulder injection blind. Um, there is no way to reproduce a blind injection on every human being the same way. So it's really analogous to if you bought a car, um, would you buy the car with uh, a backup camera or without a backup camera? And it's a free option. Um, most people would elect to do the backup camera. And if you had a race car driver and you had him drive both cars and asked him to park one inch behind the car behind him, he could reproduce it, you know, at least 99 times out of 100, um, while someone blindly could never, you know, reproduce that consistently. So it's a very uh, rudimentary thought. But uh, so I use it on a day in and day out basis. And there are very few providers in the entire desert that do that. So it's kind of a niche that I, I really enjoy to be in. Um, certain types of braces, cortisone injections, hyaluronic acid injections, PRP, which I should have hopefully soon. Uh, I think they're restarting that whole process. Things kind of slowed down with coronavirus. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy, another thing in the future. Prolotherapy. To be honest, I don't do a whole lot of it anymore. I haven't found it super effective. Um, stem cell injections. Perhaps in the future, right now, there's too much um, bad news around it and unproven methods just yet. So it's still very experimental. And then um, there's concussion tools. So generally, what the feedback has been, most people can get in pretty quickly. Um, the main thing, the main feedback is that um, there's one person to go to for everything. I don't, ha they don't have to go to multiple people. And additionally, I'm the only person you'll see. So I don't have any PAs. I don't have any nurse practitioners. I, I am the only person that sees every patient and treats um, every single patient. So my goal is to maintain that um, uh, architecture of the clinic and um, we'll see what the future holds, but this is so far how we're doing it. And um, it's been pretty good. So I'm going to get into musculoskeletal disorders and what that means. And this is kind of an uh, overview, of just a grand scheme of musculoskeletal disorders and how they happen. So anytime you have a highly repetitive task, some people that type a lot on a keyboard, for instance, that would be a repetitive task. And that can create issues. Forceful exertions, um, someone that was, you know, chopping wood or, you know, doing any activity, even, even a forceful exertion, uh, swinging a tennis racket. Uh, repetitive or sustained awkward positions. Believe it or not, I like I saw a guy that was uh, cleaning his equipment and he was on the floor and lying on his hip and he significantly injured his hip from that. So there are various methods um, uh, and ways that you can have musculoskeletal disorders. And again, they're a component of ergonomic factors and individual factors. So the ergonomic ones or the type of force, the repetition, the posture at the time of doing it. And then individual factors are what are your fitness levels, right? So if you're not used to bending over every day and one day you do, and then all of a sudden you get up and your knee flares up on you, that is probably a more uh, poor fitness, um, just an irregularity to that type of movement. And then that was a postural thing that was ergonomic that you're not just used to doing. So this is what results in injuries. And it's a combination of these things in, in every scenario that causes a, a musculoskeletal disorder. 
So you have a degree of, this is just demonstrating fatigue and recovery um, and the seesaw of that. Um, at a certain point, the fatigue creates the injury and then you have to basically, um, the continued risk and the continued exposure will uh, make things worse. Um, so we got to get you to the recovery side of things. Um, and this is just another graph demonstrating your peak health and what happens with uh, fatigue and um, continued pain and continued exacerbation. Um, you start to, you know, fatigue, discomfort, pain, and then loss of function. So when you get to the point where you're limping or you cannot walk anymore because your knee hurts so bad, you've really um, gone down this route to the level where things are very inflamed or there is something underlying that's wrong that needs to be looked at. So we're gonna get into now just very common conditions that I see in the clinic. And um, starting off with tennis and golfer's elbow. This does not imply that you must play tennis or you must play golf to uh, have these conditions. The medical term is for tennis elbows, lateral epicondylitis, and the golfer's elbow is considered medial epicondylitis. So painful, these are painful conditions on the outside and inside. Outside of the elbow is tennis elbow, inside is golfer's elbow. So lateral and medial. So there are tendons that go from the hand um, all the way up the forearm and they connect to the bones on the side of the elbow. So on the outside, there are the extensors that go on the, um, on the outside part of your hand and on the inside part of your hand, every time you, you, you uh, close your hand, um, all of those tendons go to the inside part of your elbow. And I'll show you some pictures of that so you get an idea. So again, the wrist extensors are what you see up top and they, they go all the way and attach to the outside of the elbow. The wrist flexors are what you see on the bottom and they all go and they attach to the inside of the elbow. So that leverage point at the elbow is, can sometimes uh, be very irritated and this is an illustration of that. So you have pain and you have what looks like micro tears in the uh, tendon and the muscle um, that could be on the outside or the inside part of the elbow. So the key is overall, um, how do we evaluate this and treat this and what was the cause? So the cause is really overuse or repetitive activities. Um, activities, again, this is the, you don't have to be an athlete. So painters, plumbers, um, auto workers, cooks, butchers, anything that could be repetitive um, could potentially cause this. And usually you have burning and pain um, or sharp pains at the inner part of the elbow or even outer part of the elbow. And some people even have decreased grip strength. You don't really need any specialized testing. You really don't usually need an x-ray or anything to determine this at all. This is just a good examination is plenty. Getting into treatment options for this. And, and I'm gonna just give you an overview because we're gonna touch on a lot of these things repetitively but uh, price is just protection, rice, uh, rest, ice, compression, elevation. So generally um, acute injuries, ice is always favorable. Um, after several days of icing, then heat could be utilized. At that point, heat is more of a, let me get loosened up. And then after doing an activity, again, ice would be favorable. So um, for the most part, that's kind of how I look at things. Um, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, NSAIDs, this includes ibuprofen, Aleve, Meloxicam, um, th those are some of the very common ones, or ibuprofen as a generic or naproxen. Um, these are all great anti-inflammatories. Actually, prednisone is, or, or steroids are also fall, not as an NSAID, but they're actually a steroid. The whole purpose of these medications are to reduce inflammation. So don't look at them as pain medications. Now keep in mind, Tylenol is not an NSAID and it's not an anti-inflammatory. So taking Tylenol is some mitigates some of the pain, but it actually doesn't uh, change the inflammatory response. And almost every scenario um, that causes pain is related to inflammation in the body. So if you can knock out the inflammation, you will subsequently knock out the pain. So a narcotic, however, like Percocet or Norco or Tramadol even, they literally block pain. So they don't actually treat any underlying issue whatsoever. So I don't really find any utility in those. I don't, I don't prescribe them. Uh, I mean, I rarely ever have prescribed a narcotic. 
usually I try to figure out the root issue and then see what we can do to fix that. So NSAIDs are useful. Um, and steroids, again, they're not a non-steroidal, they're actually a steroidal, but they're also very powerful anti-inflammatories. Um, treatments, stretching, therapy, also useful. Certain types of braces, specifically with this um, condition, counterforce brace, it is literally a band that wraps around the forearm. I'm sure many people have seen people use it. The key is using it correctly and using it uh, long enough um, because what it does is basically offloads the tendon, allows it to heal by reducing the stress on it. The evidence has demonstrated repetitively that um, PRP, platelet-rich plasma injections, are actually very helpful. The reason they are, and I'm going to compare it to steroids, okay? So a tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, you should not ever inject a steroid. Now, people have gotten steroids, and it's not, it's not going to kill you if you've had a steroid. But um, the consequence of a steroid injection in an area like this is that it causes detriment and degrades the tendon. So that actually only potentiates repetitive um, injury in the future and chronic pain. So PRP is more of a regenerative thought process. So it's literally taking your blood, spinning it down, and re-injecting it into the damaged tendon. The reason it works is because tendon has very bad blood supply. So if it gets damaged, it doesn't heal well. So once you um, inject it with PRP, you're basically supplementing it with healing factors. So they have studied this very extensively over several year periods of time and shown it to be very superior. Unfortunately, it's not covered by insurance. And um, that's what kind of sucks about it because it would be an awesome option. Um, like I said, I will be getting it. Um, we haven't set prices or anything as of yet, but I think it's a very useful tool for those, especially looking for an alternative to um, other types of injections and also looking for regenerative type of uh, biologic procedures. Um, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, it's literally like lithotripsy. It's like breaking up kidney stones with shockwaves. So the point again is to increase the blood supply um, within. Um, and sometimes we even do needling where we just take a needle and we actually jab the area repetitively. Really, it sounds like you know, barbaric, we're damaging it, but truthfully it is. It, it, it is damaging the tendon. And by doing that, you cause it to bleed. And when you cause it to bleed, you actually uh, uh, in, instill the healing process once again. So if things do not heal properly, that's when we end up dealing with chronic pain scenarios. And then lastly is surgery. And rarely do I ever have to send anyone for surgery. The people that are more likely to have surgery are those that have had cortisone injections. Osteoarthritis, a big topic. So this comprises every joint in your body, from your hands to your knees to shoulders, your back, everywhere has joints, anywhere that can articulate, anywhere that can bend. So this is a wear and tear arthritis. It occurs when the cartilage that cushions and protects the bones wears away. So for those who are not vegetarian or have seen chicken bones, uh, or uh, usually that's the easiest to look at a drumstick, and at the end, there's a yellow soft, um, that's the cartilage. That is the same as all joints of your body. And that, that is part of the cushioning. And it's literally very smooth and very soft and very slick. So if you remove that coating, you're left with the rough, rough underside of the bone. So when people hear bone on bone, those words, it's because there is no more cartilage left and you're left with bone. Now imagine the bone surface is like sandpaper and two bones rubbing against each other like sandpaper is clearly going to cause or start a fire. Fire analogous to inflammation and inflammation um, can cause swelling and, and, and pain. So going back to your anti-inflammatories, if you can stop that process, the arthritis will not go away. However, the inflammation related to it will stay away. Um, so this, again, can occur, occur in any part of the body. Uh, pictures, two pictures here, normal joint and osteoarthritic joint. The normal joint, you have a bone, you have a capsule that surrounds it. So it's an area that's encompassed uh, within a um, sheath there is fluid within every joint. There's a small amount of fluid that helps lubricate the joint. It's like oil in a motor. Um, and then you have the cartilage surface in between the bones. 
And then again, the cart the in in some cases you have a meniscal lining or a labral or something else that's also between the bones that help additionally cushion the area. So on the osteoarthritis side, you can see obliteration of that space. So the bones essentially are getting close to their touching each other in that picture and they rub against each other and then people develop bone spurs. So if you look at uh, mostly the hands, right? If you look at a hand um, of an arthritic, uh, arthritic hand, you'll see that the bones are actually wider or there might be a deformity and it's bending in a direction that, um, uh, in an opposite direction. So it, it, these are things that can happen with just wear and tear over many years of use. Again, another illustration of a healthy knee joint on the left, um, the healthy articular cartilage and what it looks like. And on the right, you can see it almost looks like Swiss cheese. Um, the, the cartilage itself could have holes in it. It can be worn away. And that's just from time and use. And then the spurring, uh, the bone spurs can happen all around the area. Um, so imagine just like a muffin top, right? If you, if you press the top, it'll, it'll, it'll wrap around the, the, the ends. So that's what actually happens in most cases of arthritis um, after a prolonged period of time. Uh, this is an x-ray, and for those of you that have seen the x-rays, um, the, the normal joint space is illustrated on the left. So you can see the black space in between. In between there, the assumption is that if you have space, that means you have cartilage. The cartilage we cannot see on the x-ray, but we can see the bone. So because you can see their space, you can assume there is cartilage. On the right, you can see that the bone is literally touching the bone and you can assume there's no cartilage. So that is very representative. And if you look on the sides of the bones, you can see like irregularities and bone spurs and all that's just a side effect of uh, wear and tear arthritis over years. What causes it? Again, gradual wear and tear. Uh, and again, people ask, you know, why am I 40 and I have bad arthritis or why am I 90 and I have arthritis? So the truth is, is some people are born with uh, analogous to a, a car and tires. Some people's tires last 20,000 miles and some last 200,000 miles. And again, it depends on how you drive them. Um, so there's a lot of variables in that. And um, the other risk factors are you know, obesity. So the more you weigh, the more likely there's going to be a lot more pressure and joints like your knees. Again, your age, injury. So especially if you've dislocated something or significantly injured something, there is a high likelihood that um, you could develop post-traumatic arthritis uh, due to trauma. And then family history. Another thing to keep in mind is like, for instance, I see a lot of knees. So a lot of people have had knee scopes for meniscus surgery. And, and at that time, it's, you know, maybe 15 years ago, that was very, very common. It's probably, it's still, it's still out there and, and it still happens and people still do get meniscus surgeries. However, the amount of people are dramatically diminished. The reason is they've done extensive studies to show that if you have a perfect knee and the meniscus is torn, you may still be able to manage it non-operatively and you may still live with no pain and no symptoms. Um, but some people have recurrent symptoms that do not get better no matter what, and they could benefit from surgery. When you go in to do surgery, you, all you do is cut the meniscus, and rarely can they repair it. So they remove it. What happens subsequently is years to come, you've removed that cushioning. So there is less cushioning in that knee, and that knee will become arthritic faster than the other knee that may not have had surgery. So that is a very clear correlation with almost everyone I've ever seen with uh, knee scopes. Uh, history of arthroscopic surgery. Additionally, people um, have damage from the knee scope. So no one means to damage the knee, but when you put a knee scope in a knee, you can actually nick the cartilage and that can also cause damage as well. So there's always risks involved when doing those procedures. So you got to make sure it's the right person to do it on and um, right clinical scenario to do it on. Um, what are the symptoms any joint, like I said, most people have pain, aching, decreased motion. Uh, they can't bend the knee the same way or bend the hands the same way or bend the elbow. So there's a limitation of range of motion and usually it's pretty mechanical. So imagine um, you know, your car tire is no longer round and it's shaped like a square. So clearly it's not gonna rotate the same way. So when you get to that edge, it doesn't want to roll over. Um, 
So imagine there are some joints that will literally stop at a maximum point and it will not go any further. And that's usually from bone spurs that create um, misshapen uh, joints. So usually it feels worse in the morning. So a lot of stiffness in the morning, you get out of bed and you kind of hobble a little bit and you say, you know, ah, this just takes me a little bit. And then once you get up and moving, you're like, I'm fine throughout the day. It's just when I'm sitting or if you're sitting even in a car for a prolonged period of time, your knees will feel like it takes a little bit to get moving again. So loss of motion, stiffness, very common. And people have enlargement of the joint as well. A lot of people with the knees, they say, well, why is this knee so much bigger than the other one? Um, they think it's just fluid when it's actually the bone itself that's um, actually changed with time. What do you need to see osteoarthritis? X-rays are plenty. Uh, almost every scenario in X-ray is more than enough. Um, X-rays show osteoarthritis just better than most things. A CT is a better X-ray. Obviously, there are certain indications where it's needed. For instance, an X-ray where I have a high suspicion there's a fracture, but I don't see it on the X-ray. A CT would see it. Um, there is a lot more radiation with the CT, so it's not really indicated for everyone to just get a CT. MRIs don't have radiation, however, they see just about everything. Soft tissue, tendons, um, you know, meniscus, labral lining, they see all of those things. And because of that, they're not as uh, good at just looking at bone. Um, so the right test for you know, the right condition, really, that's what I'm getting at. So in most, place, in most cases of osteoarthritis, simple x-rays plenty. Treatments, depending on the joint involved, but let's say something like a weight-bearing joint like the knees, high-impact activities will never be your friend. Anytime you put more um, gravitational force, like if you run and jump, there is more pressure on joints. Um, knees, hips, um, they do take quite a bit of force. Um, so obviously, if you have increased weight, you're only exponentially increasing it. So um, there are not many ways to avoid um, gravity's effects, right? Other than you can use the pool, for instance, that does minimize uh, gravitational effects. There's less force when you're moving around a pool or jumping or walking in a pool. So the activities, pool-related activities are always encouraged. Obviously, if you can travel to space one day, that would also be helpful, maybe for a short period of time. Um, weight loss, obviously, uh, combating gravitational forces. Uh, NSAIDs, as I mentioned before, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. I really like Aleve specifically, and, and the reason is, or naproxen, same drug, um, each one of these anti-inflammatories have a uh, duration of action. So ibuprofen is roughly six hours. So in order to take ibuprofen and cover yourself around the clock, you'll be taking it four times a day. Aleve is 12 hours, so you only have to take it twice a day. Why is that important? So imagine, again, you're fighting a fire and you throw a cup of water on that fire and you walk away. And that would be the equivalent of just taking an ibuprofen and saying, okay, well, tomorrow, hopefully I'll be better. Fire is back tomorrow and then you do it again. So instead of doing that, it would be easier to just put a hose on the fire and completely knock the fire out. Now, the only way you can do that with a medication is cover yourself around the clock. And you have to do it long enough to ensure it's gone. So I typically do these things for about two weeks straight. Now, a couple variables, not everyone can do it. People have stomach ulcers or on uh, blood thinners. Um, so we have to talk about if you'd even be a candidate to do it. So I wouldn't just advise people going to get ibuprofen and such and taking it, especially if you've been advised to uh, not take something like that. So these are all things I do look at. I do look at your kidney function. I do look at everything and make sure that you would even be a candidate to do that. And that's a very easy thing to try for two weeks. And about 40% of the people I see are better with just that, surprisingly. Um, so therapy and stretching, bracing, again, cortisone injections. Cortisone has been used forever um, for all joints in the body. It is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. The only negative effects of cortisone is that it does cause some wear and tear. So it does weaken the cartilage surfaces. And that's why there's a certain limit to the number of times you should get injected or number of frequency. So three months has been created. It's been utilized for a long time because if you start injecting the joint more soon than three months, you may cause even further detriment. So there are other options and different types of cortisone that can be used. Um, I use one that's a long acting that basically lasts in the knee for three to four months every other steroid is in and out within two weeks. So that it's like a sprinkler system on a fire that you just put out and it's there for three to four months. So it, you can ensure that, or at least try to ensure that it doesn't flare all the way back up again. 
hyaluronic acid has been out for a long time. People have known it as Synvisc, Monovisc. Um, visco supplementation is is another you know way to uh, another name for it. But um, the chicken cartilage injections or rooster injections, and lots of people have different names for it. Gel injections. Um, they are effective, not for everybody. Uh, Medicare approves these. Um, and it's probably maybe 65% of patients I see do really well with it and the other don't. And, and really what it is, is essentially the fluid within the knee that allows it to move and lubricate. This is a synthetic product. Well, some of them are not synthetic, but I only use the synthetic ones. Um, I'll get into that. Um, and it's basically simulating the fluid within the knee and allowing it, giving it the basically vitamin, which is hyaluronic acid, allowing it to lubricate and reduce the friction from the roughness. So it's basically literally like an oil in the knee. I would look at it that way. Um, why I use a synthetic version is because the Synvisc, for instance, 3% of people have a very, very bad allergic reaction. You will not be able to know who you are it just will be a terrible reaction. So 3% is way, way, way too high for me, given the number that I do. I will see several people every two weeks that are gonna be uh, having a severe reaction. So it's not necessary. There are plenty of companies that make uh, a synthetic form of this and it works, should be equally as well. Again, PRP injections, as I talked about before, and then worst cases are surgery. Um, when I talked about knee scopes, um, sometimes bones get so bad, like for instance, in the foot where people have really bad bunions because of arthritis, there are not many replacement options for that. So people, what they do is they just fuse the joint. So if you stop it from bending, then there's nowhere to cause pain. Um, also in the spine, people get fusions in the spine and that the whole key is so that the bones don't have to rub against each other. They're just fixed in place. And then replacements, very common shoulder, uh, hip and knee. Um, and again, that is the last stage. So anytime someone asks, well, do I need a knee replacement? And the question is, what is your pain level? And, and just because you have arthritis doesn't mean you need a knee replacement. You can have severe arthritis your entire life and not have pain or have minimal pain. So just because your knee arthritis looks bad doesn't correlate with the symptoms in all cases. So when do you get knee surgery? You get knee surgery when nothing else works and the pain is intolerable. So if you expect 100% for knee surgery, there is no such thing. There is no 100% any surgery. So you always have to make sure that your expectations going in are that. Um, so if you were in a 10 out of 10 pain, you can't get any worse, um, and you have a knee surgery and you end up with a 3 out of 10, you're quite happy. That's much better. Seven points improved. If you're at a 3 out of 10 and you end up at a 3 out of 10 afterwards or a 2 out of 10, you'll be quite upset. Um, so uh, setting your expectations and having better outcomes is, is really, I think that's what, uh, what happens with better outcomes. Um, the uh, pre-operative scenario is that bad that the post-operative scenario, no matter even if it wasn't perfect, is still far better than what it was previously. So I really try to set expectations and um, see what people's desires are and what their goals are in life before we go down these routes. Getting into the next joint is shoulder, big, big area. Um, many parts of the shoulder, the rotator cuff, the bursa, um, the um, arthritis can happen, broken bones can happen, instability from dislocations can happen. Um, so there are many reasons why.
I think I'm back online again. I can hear you now. Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. So bursitis. Um, so bursas are areas of fluid filled sacs. There are many areas of bursas in the shoulder, the hip, um, the, the ankle. So uh, they're usually located around joints. They actually, between the tendon and bone, they provide lubrication. So the, the benefit is um, because of that lubrication, you reduce friction. Um, but as a result of any inflammation in the joint or the tendon, the bursa can fill with fluid. So that's what we call a bursitis. So that doesn't really tell you a whole lot, right? Oh, I have a bursitis of the shoulder, but that doesn't mean anything. That just means I have inflammation of the shoulder. It's like saying I have fluid in the knee. It doesn't matter because why do you have fluid? That's the key. What, what caused the fluid, right? So it's kind of a general term. So that's why I don't really use it much. But just to give you an idea of when people say bursitis or bursa of the shoulder, they're talking about this particular area. Um, and it's usually associated with rotator cuff uh, tendinitis or pathology or tears. And you can see the blue area is considered the bursa and it sits at the level uh, between the deltoid muscle, which is the muscle on the side of the shoulder. If you, if you press your shoulder, that's the deltoid right on the outside. You, you can feel it deep to that right underneath that is the bursa and right underneath that is the rotator cuff. So um, when I do injections, for instance, I put a needle directly into the bursa and I use it under ultrasound. You can literally visualize where that needle goes. Um, so yeah, that is an area where it disperses and it goes in the whole area surrounding the rotator cuff. So that's a benefit to localizing the area. But um, saying you have a bursitis just implies you have inflammation in the shoulder. So tendinitis, um, there are various types of tendinitis. So what do tendons do? They connect muscle to bone. There are two types, acute and chronic. Uh, acute is you know, excessive ball throwing or overhead activities. Um, and usually uh, considerations of acute are time. So less than three months is usually acute, greater than three months is usually chronic. Now, a chronic process is like degenerative disease like arthritis. So for instance, if you get an x-ray at the age of 50, 60, 70, and it shows bad arthritis, it didn't happen yesterday, even though the pain might have started yesterday. Um, it's been there for you know, years, and this has just been there. And then everyone always asks, well, why does it hurt now? Um, something happened. It could have been you know, stepping the wrong way, twisting the wrong way. Um, there's something that started the fire, and then it just grew and grew and grew. So it is impossible sometimes to, to tell um, exactly what caused it. Um, but some people, you know, they felt like the knee, knee gave way, for instance, or uh, the shoulder gave out or something. And so that's something that people classically mention, um, especially with these chronic conditions. So getting back to the shoulder, uh, four most commonly affected tendons. There are four rotator cuff muscles and tendons, and then there are uh, biceps tendon. So the rotator cuff musculature, um, again, in the front of the shoulder, there's the subscapularis and going up top, there's the supraspinatus. And then if you go around the back, it's the infraspinatus and then the teres. Um, so they all do different functions of the shoulder. And this is a side view and you can see up very top the supraspinatus and wrapping around the back is on the left side is the infraspinatus and then the teres minor is below that. If you look towards the front, there is the biceps tendon. So that kind of goes underneath the rotator cuff and then it dives really deep into the shoulder. So with tendon tears, again, it could be acute or it could have been chronic process. It could have been slowly getting chipped away at uh, over years and years and years and it gets thicker and it can tear. So you can get complete tears, uh, partial tears. Um, when you have a complete rupture or tear, the actual tendon and, and muscle gets pulled away from the bone. So there's a separation. And usually like for instance, in the rotator cuff, you're gonna have weakness of a specific movement. Or if it was your Achilles, for instance, you wouldn't be able to walk because you would not be able to bend your foot downwards. Um, so depending on if a tendon is completely ruptured, um, what will be the clinical picture. Now an area like the hamstring, there's the semimembranosus tendon which, uh, muscle, which if it's completely torn, you would notice no difference at all. So there are areas where you don't lose function. Again, biceps tendon, if you ruptured the biceps, there are two heads. The majority of people rupture the one that doesn't really do anything. 
Um, so you actually notice no difference in uh, strength or um, you just have a little bit of discomfort when it happens, obviously. Um, so not all of these cases have to be operatively repaired. So this is an illustration of a ruptured biceps. Um, what you're seeing is the two heads there. So the two white areas up top and um, the one that one of the areas, this is just one of them that's ruptured. Um, it's just demonstrating a characteristic bulge. So what you get is a Popeye-like deformity. I'll show you a picture. So, you know, actually some people say it's actually not a bad look. So, uh, and then they actually asked me, can I do that to the other side? So it's symmetric. Um, so what you get is since the one tore, you actually have an enlargement that happens there. And in some cases, um, again, you would have no functional limitations here. You'd be able to be just fine. Actually, some people have significant relief of pain because the biceps was creating a lot of pain in the shoulder. And because it tore, it no longer can create pain. However, since the muscles kind of bunched up there, some people feel spasms there. And if that lasts, it could always be pulled back and repaired. And what they do is they call it a tenodesis and they attach it to a different area of the shoulder where it doesn't cause any pain. So if someone can live with this, there is no issue with um, leaving it this way. Another common scenario is uh, shoulder impingement. Um, and this is really when the, if you raise your arm up to the side or um, in certain motions above head, especially with above head activities, especially tennis players uh, with overhead serves, this is very common. And what happens is the bone on the bottom, the humerus, kind of bumps into the bone above it, which is the acromion, and the rotator cuff sits right in between. So it pinches it together along with the bursa, and that repetitive motion causes a lot of inflammation and pain. So very easy history, your physical is plenty. Um, a lot of the tests I do in clinic just on physical are more than enough to diagnose all of these conditions. Keep swapping out. <laughs> Batteries are going. All right, back again. So um, the x-rays are plenty to um, assess the bony anatomy, and we can say, hey, look, you have arthritis, or you don't have arthritis, or this is what's predisposing you to develop the symptoms you do. So for me, x-rays are plenty. We just do it in office, and we can tell. In some cases, um, an MRI may be necessary because we have to go down the surgical route because nothing non-surgical has worked. So an MRI can be helpful. Um, ultrasound, I do do that in office as well when I do a lot of the procedures I do. And a CAT scan is, again, very specifically only looking at a fracture. So rarely for the shoulder do you use CAT scans unless you're surgically planning, um, especially for a replacement sh shoulder surgeon that's trying to build a um, a prosthesis for your shoulder. They want to look at a CAT scan to be able to, to build it. Um, so treatments, activity modifications. If you're an overhead server, underhand might be your next step um, to stop the continued provocation of the symptoms. Uh, protection, protection, rest, ice, uh, NSAIDs. Um, like I said, the anti-inflammatory regimen is always great. Therapy, stretching. Now, the benefit is if you strengthen the rotator cuff, it will remain more stable. And if it remains more stable, it holds the ball and socket nice and firm into the joint. The more it can, um, the more laxity there is, it has a higher risk of developing these symptoms of impingement because then it moves around and it bumps into other bones and it can pinch the rotator cuff. So yes, therapy is uh, a useful tool. Additionally, cortisone injections, they are very helpful to reduce levels of inflammation for sure. Um, this is not a continued fix. I believe in it for, there's some people that get one injection. I never see them again. There's some people that, um, you know, get one and I have to see them back in three months. Um, but it, so it depends, you know, if there's some patients that I have, that are 95 and they have no desire to have surgery for the remainder of their life. So if, if doing injections for the remainder of their life is, is enough, then that's enough. Um, so it really depends on the scenario. Everyone has a different uh, desire and uh, um, surgical need. And some people need surgery and some people don't. But 
again, I'm not just freely uh, wishing to inject cortisone indefinitely either. So we, we do have to always talk about when it's useful. And then the other key is where it's placed is also very important. Um, so hyaluronic acid, in some cases, PRP, again, regenerative options, and then surgery, arthroscopic surgery or joint replacement for the shoulder specifically. Carpal tunnel, moving on to the uh, hand and wrist. So fairly straightforward, pain, numbness, tingling in the hand. Um, it involves the median nerve distribution, and usually that's from repetitive uh, use uh, or compression of the nerve, uh, depending on your activities. Um, and then if it's prolonged, it causes damage to the nerve. So people get um, symptoms of numbness and tingling and pain that lingers on, uh, even despite not doing anything. Um, so if you look at the anatomy, this is a view of the wrist. And what crosses over the wrist is what's called a transverse carpal ligament. The median nerve is that nerve, so the yellow nerve that kind of goes right under the ligament, and it goes to primarily the thumb, the first finger, the second finger, and the third finger. The fourth finger is usually never affected by carpal tunnel. So anytime you think you might have carpal tunnel, look at the inside part of your hand, the palm, and it doesn't go to the other side, okay? Not, it doesn't go to the back of the hand, but it's really primarily the palm of the hand. And numbness and tingling involving the first four digits, um, that could potentially be carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, now, it's due to the compression and that happens from inflammation under that transverse carpal ligament. So that nerve can get compressed, um, like in this illustration, and because it's compressed, it sends a numbness and tingling sensation to the hand. So you really are trying to reduce the amount of um, either repetitive stress that would cause less inflammation, or you can use anti-inflammatories, or you can do things like injections. Um, so what causes it? Again, repetitive use, um, your hand and wrist position, typing, pregnancy. Why pregnancy? Because people have increased um, uh, fluid um, in pregnancy. Uh, in their body, um, other conditions such as diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and thyroid imbalances, and then hereditary. Some people, it's just something that uh, many people have in the family. Um, again, numbness, tingling, burning, as we discussed, sometimes even weakness. If you let it go for too long, it can actually affect the strength of the muscles, and then it develops weakness of the hand. Um, and some people even have the numbness or pain sensation that goes up the forearm, even up to the shoulder in some cases. So what tests can you do? Usually exam is plenty, but actual tests and EMG is a nerve conduction study that actually tests the nerve um, and it basically uh, assesses whether the nerve has been compressed for a prolonged period of time. Uh, X-rays um, can sometimes be helpful to look at bony anatomy, ultrasound is helpful, and MRI can sometimes be. Uh, treatment bracing and splinting, nice night splints. So you can literally wear a neutral night splint. You can get it at any pharmacy and you wear that at night. The reason is, is because a lot of us have motions at night, um, such as bending our wrist and we don't realize we're in a fixed position and we wake up and we have to shake our hand because the nerve has been compressed all night. So that prevents that compression. The repetitive compression is what causes continued pain. So if you can avoid that with just simple night splints at night, you're giving yourself rest and you're giving yourself the ability um, to not develop a chronic scenario. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen to leave, so on and so forth, activity modifications, therapy, and again, cortisone injections are direct anti-inflammatories to the carpal tunnel to reduce the swelling. The worst case scenario is to actually cut the ligament that is actually continuing to compress the carpal tunnel, such as here. You can see where the ligament was dissected, <coughs> excuse me, and the uh, nerve has been freed. And because of that, um, there's no longer any compression on the nerve and the nerve should have reduction in symptoms. So that's the ultimate uh, fix if need be. Um, and, and the most I'll do is I'll do, a, a, the most I will do is about two injections, three months apart. So one injection, if it still came back, one more injection, if it still came back, then I would recommend a release. However, if someone has very bad carpal tunnel and they're starting to lose the musculature in their hands and weakness, then we may consider an injection, but we might likely expedite a surgical referral. So now just to touch on a few other conditions, just in general, because uh, we touched on some kind of bigger um, topics. So Achilles injuries, ankle sprains, ligament injuries, knee meniscal tears, labral tears of the hip, hip impingement, 
minor fractures, again, rotator cuff injuries, foot pain and problems, shoulder dislocations, frozen shoulder, trochanteric bursitis, super common as well, and then plantar fasciitis. So, and then what do these solutions mean to you? Single musculoskeletal provider for all of your non-operative complaints. So essentially your quarterback in the orthopedic world or your primary orthopedist. I kind of look at it that way. Um, improved evaluations, less wasted time and resources. And we can always get you in to see a surgeon if need be. And it will always be substantially faster than attempting to go that route on your own. So I can take some questions um, if we can do that. Well, I had asked the one um, on blood thinners, you can't use NSAIDs. So when you- right, If anyone has questions, I've turned the unmute. Okay. Or if you have a question, please feel free to ask it now. Can you not hear me? Can't hear you, Candace. Yes, no. we can, can hear you. We can okay. hear you, Candace. Okay, so I did have a question on the blood, blood thinners, you can't use NSAIDs. So what do you recommend for inflammation? What kind of blood thinners? Oh my gosh, I'm on aspirin and I, oh my God, I'm on so many pills, it's ridiculous. Um, so, yeah. So I'd it have depends. To so if it is a like Coumadin, Warfarin, Eliquis. Plavix. Uh, Plavix. Yeah. So. And aspirin. Plavix and aspirin. So you have a much higher chance of bleeding, right? So yeah. in those cases, if it was just aspirin alone, I would probably not be as concerned, but the combination is going to increase bleeding. So depends on what area you want to treat. Now, certain areas are superficial. Um, so give me an example of an area you're, you're thinking. Plantar fasciitis. What's that? Plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis. Oh, okay. So to be honest, um, one option is topical Voltaren. Um, it's a superficial, well, it's attempting to be a, it only usually works in superficial areas. So Voltaren is topical. You can get it over the counter now. It is an NSAID. Um, however, it penetrates the skin. So only 6% gets absorbed in your blood. Very safe. Even if you were on a high dose blood thin, like, like Coumadin or Eliquis, I'm still safe with it. You using it. So you, you can apply that directly right? to the area that is um, an issue. Again, it's not going to work in an area like the hip. It's too large of a structure and will not penetrate deep enough. But for plantar fasciitis, fundamentally, more than 80, 90% of people get better with simply the appropriate yeah. stretching exercises. Um, you can look up a million of them. Um, and then using yeah. a roller. Some people like to use a lemon and put it in the freezer and freeze it and then put it underneath their foot and, and roll it every, every morning uh, or several times a day to keep that fascia nice and loosened up. And then um, worst case scenarios are injection options to it. Um, so steroids have no effect um, on the blood thinner component of it. But again, these are not things you want to do um, in, 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 in life. For plantar fasciitis, people usually don't want any more than three injections because there are other side effects to doing any more than that. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, not necessarily doing surgery for torn meniscus, but I wasn't clear what the options are for helping. So without um, surgery. So it depends on the scenario. So if you have a perfect knee, you have no arthritis in your knee, and you happen to have a torn meniscus, um, it is the, the, the problem with the torn meniscus, it's like a, a flap of tissue on the inside of the knee that kind of moves around and it creates pain. So in the acute phase, there's a lot of swelling and discomfort. So if you can use anti-inflammatories to knock it down and, and then rehab it, many cases can get better with time. Now, it's not like it's gonna get better in two weeks. It may take a lot longer than that, but um, there is definitely a rehabilitation potential. Now, there's certain scenarios, and in many cases, where it's just an isolated meniscal tear, and there's really, there isn't a surgical necessity. So what I'm saying is, if you don't get surgery, you're not harming yourself in any way. So you can have a tear and it not have any impact in your you know, long-term outlook. Um, so in those cases, you can do a cortisone injection to really try to calm it down. And if you calm it down enough, I, like my, both of my knees have meniscal tears. I've never had surgery. I've played every sport. I, you know, it, it is not something that in every scenario you have to have surgically, 
um, uh, addressed. Now, they've like going back to the surgery, um, if you have arthritis in the knee and you have a meniscal tear, they usually go hand in hand. The arthritis causes the meniscal tear. So they've proven this with many studies that showed uh, sham surgery versus arthroscopic surgery for meniscectomy is the same outcome. So if they stuck a knee scope in and just shot water in it or went in and cut the meniscus, there was no difference. Because the reason was, is the main reason for pain was actually the arthritis. So it is a very small indication these days to have arthroscopic knee surgery in the setting of arthritis. There's only one actually, mechanical symptoms. So if the meniscus is flipped on itself, what happens is the knee can lock in its place and it won't move. Or is it extremely painful because it's, it's locked? Um, so that is a clear surgical indication, regardless of what the knee looks like with arthritis. Um, so that is, that is, that is um, kind of the overview of, of what that is. But um, for conservative measures, yes, NSAIDs, uh, rehabilitation, and even injections can mitigate the discomfort from meniscal tears. Other questions, Commander? Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if no one has any more questions, and I don't see any popping up, um, I guess we're done then. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you for Very having me. Very informative, um, and I hope we have you again sometime. <laughs> Thank you guys for really, having me. Really learned a lot, So, and I'm, I'm sure everyone else did. Uh, Brett, do you want to jump in and say anything at this point? No, I think we're good. Thank you all. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your attention. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you next week. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. No, thank you guys. Have a good Bye, day. everyone.